So we're glad that you're here. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I have, uh, I was mentioning to somebody else, I've been working on this series, um, which Open Bible Studio Electives, of course, is an ongoing series that a bunch of us are working on. And we try to make it more in depth. You know, it's one thing to be an inch deep and a mile wide. That doesn't get you very far when it comes to really important things in Scripture. I mean, you can still be saved by having that kind of an understanding, but uh, we know that a lot of people have that, and so what we're looking for is a little bit more depth. And so I've been working my way through this ongoing series called The Lord's Coming Wrath. It says version 7.1. I keep modifying, and, and we keep moving forward in time. So it's really not version, it's edition. Uh, it's like a college course, you know, The Lord's Coming Wrath 101, 102, 103. So we're in like, we're in postgraduate work now, I think, by, by now. But, uh, it, and so in order to cover this topic, I've been trying to figure out what's a good way to organize it. And so this particular part of it, I'm just calling it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so we've already talked about the good. Okay, in other words, when we're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm talking about people or personages, right, entities. We've got good people and what happens to them. And so we went through scripture, a number of sessions, looking at where we see those good people show up in scripture, what defines them, if you will, as a good person versus a bad person. And so that was quite extensive. Now, today, we're going to continue that discussion and we're gonna set aside the good and now we're gonna work on just the bad. Okay, now, with that said, though, we're going to have to go through a lot of the verses that we've already covered. Because there are some assumptions that are made in Scripture that when you're talking about good people who do certain things, if you don't do certain things, then you're not a good person. So that leaves you the only other option, right? That you're a, a bad person. And, and, by, and when I'm talking about a bad person, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're unredeemable. At a certain point, maybe they would be unredeemable, but uh, at a certain point there's a cutoff. Whether you like it or not, there's a cutoff. Did you realize that there are borders to heaven? <laughs> you know, everybody has to cross a river to get there. Uh, and, and that's death, right? But then not everybody can go from this country into that country. You know, so some people will be kept out of heaven. Um, it's not by heaven's choice, it's by that person's choice. Did they choose to enter that country of heaven legally or were they hoping to force their own way in by maybe their good works or whatever other means they may come up with and so today though we're going to talk about who are the bad so with that said let's go ahead and pray and then as always we'll fly through 105 slides here and we'll see how well we come out the other end all right and so father we're grateful for the day we thank you so much again for all the wonderful people that come how they entrust um, their time to us that we might give them something back in return that's of value. Uh, their return on their investment, hopefully, Lord, is a better knowledge of you, better knowledge of your, of your word, and a better understanding of who they are in relationship to you and what that means as we move forward and look down the road. And so, Lord, just give this time to you, ask that you'd use it for your good, and um, that we would absorb it all, that your spirit in us would well up swell up and uh, would just uh, fill us in a way that uh, we really understand what Scripture is talking about here. We'd, we'd see these images, these pictures. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so who are the bad? Uh, we're talking about the bad. Who are the bad? We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Who are the bad? And where did the bad first start? And so, of course, you know where the first bad if you will, people, first showed up. Book of Genesis in chapter 2, starting in verse 7, and it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is good. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, that's good. Also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
God made it, it's good, but it will soon become bad. Okay, it will soon become bad. And it's bad not so much that God made it, it's because of what man does with it. Okay, how man handles it. That's the thing that good things can become very bad. Uh, you can use a, a, a rifle to go hunting for food. You can also use it to kill a human being. Okay, how the human chooses to use it determines whether it is a good thing or a bad thing many, many times. So we keep moving on though in verse 16 there. And it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. That had to be a lot, because God never does anything in minuscule amounts. He does it in abundance, we see in Scripture many times. And so he had quite the variety. I personally like tangelos. Those are delicious and wonderful, and they're full of juice. That's the only, well, not, are pineapples trees? Because I really like pineapples, too. You know, but I mean, there, there would have been a plethora of, of types of things that he could freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. One tree out of all of those, don't eat this one. For in that day thou uh, eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we move over to the next chapter then, in Genesis chapter 3, and we start there in verse 1, and it says, Now the serpent, there's a, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's an ugly. Okay, that's an ugly. We got the good, the bad, and the ugly, that's an ugly. But now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? I mean, really? Did he really say that? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. That's bad. Okay? And because of that bad thing they did, they then became bad. Up until that moment, they had no sin in their life. Okay? Now, the thing is, God had said, here's one, and here's a multitude. All of those. As much, you, can, you can eat until you get fat if you want. Okay? You don't have to stay skinny. You can eat all you want. In abundance. Just don't eat of that one. And what did the serpent do? The serpent introduced them to a world of things that they didn't know about. And that's when they became worldly. Okay? We know that scripture, if you look down here at the bottom, I've got a little verse that you can barely see there in 1 John chapter 2. Verse 16 and 17, it says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So let's keep in mind now what we're talking about with Adam and Eve. They loved that tree more than they loved the Father and what he said. For all this is in the, um, excuse me, for all that is in the world, that's the lust of the flesh. Okay, it was good for food. Lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes, it was pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, ah, desire to make one wise. I have so much knowledge. I know so many things. Making one wise, that's the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so here we see the very first time that humanity now is exposed to the concept of worldliness. And unfortunately, Adam and Eve partook of that. And so as a result of that, then what, would, what was good and decent, we see here in the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, verse 21 continues on there in chapter 3. And it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. This is the first sacrifice that was made in scripture so an animal gave up its life okay god used that to cover them through that sacrifice also covered their sin did not remove it all right but covered their sin and this is where then we begin with the sacrificial system that we see in scripture 
a reminder to man that now they have a need for a redemption. They have a need for a covering of their sin. And actually saying that one day they're actually looking forward to the day when there will be not a covering of a sin, but a removal of sin by that animal sacrifice, which the lamb is what they would have been using back in these days. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world would be coming. That's what they're doing is they're looking forward to the future. Right? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's a bad thing, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now think about it. As a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, death entered into the world, right? Uh, spiritual death, certainly. Separation from God, certainly. But then also physical death. Okay? And we would look and we would say, what a terrible thing. But actually, that physical death is a good thing. If it wasn't for the physical death, Jesus couldn't die on the cross to pay for the sin of Adam and Eve and their children's 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 children. So you and me. Okay, so what a wonderful thing. Though it's awful and terrible what happened, even such a devastating thing as death, which we are all affected by, is a good thing because that allowed Christ to die on the cross. Otherwise, there would have been no covering, no, no redemption, no purchase by the blood sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then also keep in mind that what we have here is that Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. They're kept away from that tree of life. Imagine, had they sinned and then eaten of the tree of life, they would have been, if you will, eternally dead in their sin. You understand what I'm saying? They wouldn't have been eternally alive. Like we talk about eternal life. What is it that we enjoy about eternal life? We enjoy that we'll one day be in the presence of God. We won't fight with sin anymore. That won't be an issue and we will be eternally alive. No, they would have been eternally dead. You talk about some of these movies nowadays, you know, The Walking Dead, that's, that's what they would have been. There would have been no way for them to be saved or redeemed in that scenario. So I'm, I'm grateful, as bad as it may sound, I'm grateful for death, and I'm also grateful that they were separated out and kept away from that tree of life. Oh, I think I've covered everything there. So let's go ahead then looking in Genesis chapter 4, and we start in verse 1. So now they're outside of the garden, and it's not too long down the road that we see bad people. Adam and Eve had, had become bad, right? And now as a result of that badness, they now are passing it on to even their children. Now somehow, they knew they had to have a sacrificial system. Adam and Eve were clothed, of course. They would have been speaking with God. They would have walked with God. We know that even outside of the garden that God speaks and, and they hear. Okay, Adam and Eve, well, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain. And said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So one worked with animals and one worked with produce. Keep in mind, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they tried to cover up their sin, what did they try to use to cover up their sin? They tried to use produce, huh? fig leaves. That wasn't good enough, was it? No, it was the animal sacrifice, and that's what Abel is working with. And that then, I, I know that they would have known that it would have been passed on to them from their parents that would have said, look, if we're going to have sacrifices, which we must have, it must be an animal sacrifice. But that wasn't good enough for Cain. So not only was Cain a bad guy, but Cain became a worse bad guy, if you will. So in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering 
Abel understood. Abel chose to be obedient. In spite of his own sinfulness, in spite of his own badness, he chose to be obedient to what God had ordained. Unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. God says, no, you know what you're supposed to bring. Your brother brought it, and yet you've chosen not to. Okay? You could have probably very easily traded some of your produce for one of those animals, one of those sheep. And that would have been a fair trade. You could have brought that animal for the sacrifice. But no, you've chosen to do it your way, not my way. And so we see that Cain then becomes a badder guy, if that makes sense. And Cain was wroth. So here now, Cain is getting mad at God. Who do you think you are telling me that I can't bring the work of my hands? And his countenance fell. And it gets worse, though, unfortunately. Cain now, if you will, takes vengeance on his, on, on his brother, right? And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And so now we're very short time out of the garden. Okay, we have these two brothers born of Adam and Eve, and we have one brother murdering the other one. All it is is one generation, and we already have murder um, that has... Because badness is that bad. D did that make sense that badness is that bad? The consequences of being a sinner is really that bad. I'm, I know me, I've said this a million times, and if you've ever sat under my teaching, I know what I think. I've said that a bunch of times, and you wouldn't like if you knew what I think. Okay? I know that. I don't like what I think. I'm my own worst enemy, literally, okay? I have only me to blame. And all it takes is one of those things that I think to go from being in my mind, because it was generated in my heart, my sinful heart generated that thought, and all it takes is for just one wrong decision for me to follow through with that in a physical act. And I could have murdered somebody. I could have hit somebody with a car. I could have spewed out some foul language out of my mouth. All it takes is one momentary decision for me to go from already bad to badder. And that badder can keep getting worse and worse and worse. There is never a badest. It just gets worse and worse and worse. So we know that Cain ends up slaying his brother Abel, and so we see bad in the garden, we see bad outside of the garden, we see bad in the very next generation, and God then tells him that now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth, and received thy brother's blood from thy hand. Just to confirm that Cain really is a bad guy, if we look into the New Testament in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, we see there that these two are also mentioned again. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. God was pleased with that one. A more excellent sacrifice than Cain's. In other words, Cain's, by, by understanding these things, Cain's was worse. Abel's was good, Cain's was bad. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous, so Abel was righteous, which then indicates the opposite, that Cain was unrighteous. God testifying of his gifts, of Abel's gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You know, and even then Cain yet dead still speaketh too, doesn't he? Not of good and not of righteousness, but in fact of what exactly you shouldn't be, of the bad. Don't become one of the bad. First John carries on some of this same type of thinking. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, did Cain love his brother Abel? No, he didn't. Okay, who was of that wicked one? Who's that wicked one that we're talking about? His parents actually met that guy, all right? Satan, okay, the serpent. And slew his brother, and wherefore he slew him? Because his own works were evil. So it wasn't because of the good works that he slew Abel. It was because of Cain's own heart, mind, manifestation in the physical form, in other words, he carried out the thought, and it was evil. And um, so there you go. The book of Jude also 
In chapter 1, just verse 10 and 11, real quick, says, But these, talking about different people, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. So now this is evil, okay? These people speaking evil are equ equivalent to Cain, right? So Cain is a bad guy. So these people also are bad guys. They've gone the way of Cain. Cain, for his own personal gain, chose to kill his brother. And these people run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Remember that Balaam was the prophet who was supposed to prophesy against Israel so that he could get some financial gain from it, okay? And perished in the gainsaying of Korah, Korag, here it says. Uh, you remember the rebellion of Korah? Right, where the one particular family was grouped together, 250 people, and everybody was told to get away from them, and God slew the whole family. 250 of them eaten up by the dirt. So the question is, where do these people go? Okay, where do, we, where do we, the bad go? All right, and so we have to kind of go back, and we've got to review some information from way back before, and so we've got this word sheol, all right, I don't know if you can read the Hebrew there. If you can, good for you, because I can't. I'm just taking their word for it. But Sheol. Okay, so what is Sheol? Sheol, another word for it is Hades. Okay, when we look at this idea of Hades, it's the, the world of the dead. Um, it's, like, it's, almost, it's not a vacation place, but it's a holding place. If you wanted to say that there was ever a purgatory, this would be as close as you can get. But there is no such thing as purgatory to where you can go and you can get out later. Okay? The only reason anybody gets out of Hades is because the Lord Jesus gets them out. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. But anyhow, so we've got this place, Hades, or the grave, um, the pit. It can also be considered hell. And that's one side of it. Okay? One side of it. And by that, I'm saying that it is divided into two sections. Okay, and so this place, Hades, was not originally intended for humanity. It was originally intended, well, for the devil. And we'll see that here in this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 41. Then, say, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. So the cursed people are going to go into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so there's a place prepared for the devil and his angels, and it involves fire. Okay, verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So we've got life eternal where apparently it's got air conditioning, and then we have the, the, uh, the bad side of Hades where there is this place prepared for the devil and everlasting fire. We get more of that in this account in Luke chapter 16. You'll know the story as I start to read it. But starting in verse 19, there was a certain rich man, remember him? All right, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So in this life, he had worked toward gain. There's nothing wrong with wealth and those kinds of things. That was what he was focusing on. Okay, and lived uh, sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus didn't have the same wherewithal as the rich man, but apparently Lazarus was a man of faith. And so he was laid at the gate of the rich man, and he had all kinds of sores on him. And we'll skip over another verse here. We'll go to verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died. So Lazarus dies and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, not literally into Abraham's bosom, because you're going to see Abraham standing right next to uh, Lazarus. So it's obvious he's not in, but it's near to the bosom of Abraham. So where Abraham was. That was a good place. God honored Abraham and put him in a good place. And so this is the idea of Hades. This is the grave. Okay. Now keep in mind, Christ has not died on the cross yet. Because Christ has not died on the cross yet, their penalty for sin has not yet been paid. That's what the sacrifices were for all of those years, was to cover over until the day would come that Christ would die on the cross. And so here we go. They're now in this place of Hades, but they're in the good side of it. They're basking at the beach, so to say, as opposed to basking in the flames. All right? I know my pictures don't always work, but uh, kind of a nice concept. And the rich man also died and was buried. So both of them pass away. 
And next sentence it says, and in hell. So it's not like it's, you're going to go someplace and you're going to hang out for a while and then later on you're going to have a judgment. No, it's immediate. Okay, it's immediate. So here we've got Lazarus who dies and immediately he is with Abraham or near to the bosom of Abraham and the rich man immediately in hell, that's the other side of Hades. So there's a side for the good guys and there's a side for the bad guys. Everybody with me? That's what we're concentrating on is the good guys and the bad guys. And so we have the rich man being a bad guy. And in the place for bad guys, we know that there's fire and burning and gnashing of teeth and everything like that. And so he lifts up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. So apparently Hades, while it has both, has a separation for the good guys and a separation for the bad guys. Nary the twain shall meet, okay? And seeth Abraham far off, and Lazarus in his bosom, or next to him there. Verse 24, it says, And he cried, so this is the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Why? Because it's hot, because I'm burning, because there's flames. And send Lazarus, come across this void that's here, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. This flame was not originally intended for the rich man. This flame was intended for the devil and the angels that would follow him, the demons. That was the original intent. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that now opened up Hades with two locations. Those who were redeemed or would be redeemed when Christ came and those who rejected that. Okay, And so here we have both of them in Hades, one in the good side, one in the bad side. Okay, Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things or bad things, but now he is comforted, because he's the one that had the relationship in life. By the way, you can't change your mind once you get to the fiery side. So I made a mistake. Hello? Can I have a do-over? You, God, do you believe in mulligans? Okay. So, but he was comforted. Lazarus is comforted. Uh, and thou art tormented. So again, we see Hades has two locations. Both of them would have been in that same place, but separated one for the good guys, one for the bad guys. That opened up when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And now God needed a place for those that were his and a place for those that rejected him. And so that continued. Okay, um, so half of the neighborhood of Hades, though, is going to change. Right? And that, that half that's going to change is going to change on the day that the Lamb of God was slain. Because then the sin of humanity that accepted him was now paid for. And when it's now paid for, now those people can go and be in heaven. Okay? So, today, the good side of Hades doesn't exist anymore. The bad side of Hades still exists. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4 uh, kind of gives an, an, an understanding of this. Uh, verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, talking about Jesus now, okay, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. That's the good guys who were waiting in Hades for their sin to be paid for, who had done the sacrifices, who had this relationship with God in their heart. They knew that they needed the Redeemer. All of the things that we know today as believers, the Spirit of God would have worked on them. We know that they would then... Um, eventually, when Christ died for their sins, as he died for yours and mine, okay, for those of us that have accepted Christ as our Savior, in essence, that's what they were doing in the Old Testament, looking forward to the Messiah coming, to the Christ coming. We can look back at the Messiah, the Christ having come. And so then, when he died on the cross, he went and he retrieved. He set free those who were captive in the good half. Okay, the other ones did not accept the payment for their sins. And therefore they continue to reap the consequences, which is eternal fire, burning. Immediately they die, poof, they're there. 
Okay? So he led captivity captive. In other words, he took them and he set them free. Double negative there. Captivity captive. And gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? And this is an explanation. But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So he went, when he died on the cross, he went, he retrieved those that were in Hades, the good half of Hades, and he brought them. So that means that the bad ones are still there. So all of the bad from Adam and Eve, Cain, okay, all of those people just started falling into the grave. And as they fell into the grave, there was an immediate judgment, just like there was for the rich man. And they opened their eyes and they found themselves in hell. <clears throat> and the flame is hot. And there's no easing of that. It's like, oh, this too shall pass. No, it won't pass. And that has just been filling up more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and more up until today. But the good guys, well, let's get to that, okay? So we know, though, that Jesus went and he set the captives free that were in the good part of Hades. That he descended is the same also that ascended and far above all heavens. And so he took them with him into heaven because now their sin had been paid for. In Philippians chapter 1, we're in verse 21. This is a nice saying for us to believe. I do believe it with my heart. For to me to live is Christ. Okay, I know that I have this relationship with him. I continue to cultivate it and work it. All right, and To improve it, hopefully. And to die is gain. When I die, I don't go to Hades. Because I have a relationship with Christ, that Hades no longer exists. Okay, So for me, it's, it's gain for me to die. And my wife and I, and, and uh, now my mom, she lives with us. Uh, my mom is having some challenges with her memory, all right, and we know that her day will soon be coming. She's 85 years old, uh, very weak, okay, at home, and there's a, a certain joy to know that this frail body is going away, and she's not going to Hades, <laughs> right? And she knows that she's going to be in the presence of the Lord. So to die is gain. And that's a really nice thing. It's a nice, that's the case for believers. Okay, that's for the good guys. But I already talked about the good guys, didn't I? I'm not talking about the good guys. I'm talking about the bad guys here. So for the believer, it's gain. But for the non-believer, it's not gain. Hades is still there. It hasn't changed. So to die is not gain for the bad. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says here, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's this eternal body. You don't want the body you've got right now in heaven, I can tell you that. To take what you've got right now into eternity, that's foolishness. Trust me, I know I have this back problem, and my shoulder is starting to click every time I move it. I've already got a titanium hip. All right? I, I, I don't want this body anymore. I know it's stunning. I know that you all just really enjoy... <laughs> Right, but uh, there's a better one waiting for me one day to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. You don't get that body without Jesus Christ. So if you don't have Jesus Christ, you will be found naked, and the naked are not allowed into heaven. That's not the right garment to go to heaven. And if you try to sneak in there in the wrong garment, you will be kicked out and there will be gnashing of teeth and there will be fire and all that other stuff. For we that are in this tabernacle, in this body now, do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, we don't want to be unclothed, but clothed upon. In other words, that mortality goes away is what we're looking forward to one day might be swallowed up of life now he that hath wrought us for the same self same thing is god so god already has a plan for the good who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit and the good are the ones that have the spirit indwelling them okay, that's his down payment that's the earnest money we know it's going to be fulfilled i've got a friend who's buying a house and they have earnest money that they're going to put down on the house, saying that, yes, I intend to complete this, this agreement. 
Okay, I'm putting $1,000 down now, and I'll put the other half a million down <laughs> later on, you know. So they're, they're saying, though, that this is the down payment. And so this is what the spirit in you now, though you have the body you have now, the spirit in you now is a down payment, if you will, saying that I will complete this deal, and you will have an eternal body. But if you don't have the spirit in you, you're one of the bads. And there's no good for the bads. It's Hades. It's flames. It's hot. Therefore, we, the goods, are always confident, but the bads are not. Knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, the, goods, the, the bads don't even know that. They don't know about being absent from the Lord. They have no hope. They're just trying to make it through this life. For we walk by faith, but they don't. They walk by sight. Theirs is the opposite, isn't it? Okay? We are confident they are not, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Meanwhile, the person who doesn't have a relationship with God, the bads, the bads don't want to leave the body. The bads will do everything they can to extend their life as much as possible. And sometimes I wonder about that. I understand we all have the desire to live. But if we have hope in Jesus Christ, and if we believe what we believe, our day is coming, and God may choose to use cancer. You know, he may choose to use mental disability. He may choose to use a car accident. Whatever God chooses, that's up to him how he wants to do that. But uh, to be willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, that's a good thing. And my wife and I, we talk about that at dinner many times, and always she reminds me, honey, after she's cooked, because she knows she doesn't want me to cook, or we would all be going to be with the Lord quickly. <laughs> but, you know, after she's done cooking, you know, she says, uh, honey, I just want you to know we're one meal closer to heaven. Right? I go, yeah, yeah, one meal. But don't let me cook it. Unless it's eggs or cereal, I can do those. <laughs> All right, verse 9 there, though, it goes on and says, Where, there, uh, Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And that's why we continue to exist in this world as good people. But the bad people are not laboring for the Lord. Okay, so I'm just trying to identify that while there are good people, and many of them are seated here, there are, well, there may be amongst you some who are also bad. You know, some of you may be religious you know you like to come to bible studies that's kind of cool information to learn but if you have not genuinely in your heart taken a moment in time may 31st 1981 for me yeah i remember the church service where i walked up to the front and i said i am accepting christ as my savior today i mean i remember that i know that okay and so if you've never done that and i don't you don't have to do it in a church service but if you know that you need to accept Christ as your Savior, that you've been faking it, and it's been up here in your head, but it hasn't been here in your heart, then you need to take care of business. Whether it's somebody who's sitting here or somebody who's watching us here on, on YouTube, um, because once you've stepped off and you haven't made that decision, I guarantee you it's Hades for you. And in hell, you'll be looking for that water that won't be available. All right, so, in the meantime, though, we continue to work for the Lord, and that's one of the reasons I enjoy working with the Ministry of Zion's Hope, because we're all about that. So, um, the bad's rejection of Christ, the bad's rejection of God's plan, also rejects being present with the Lord. Okay, there is not a time that they will be able to be with the Lord. And so this place of Sheol, of hell, of Hades, continues to this day for the bad. God has never rescinded that place. From the time of Adam and Eve forward, God has never rescinded that place originally intended for the devil and, and the demons. It still exists to this day. And it's filling up with more and more souls that have rejected the Lord. And that's a sad thing, because I think of people that I know that rejected I wonder about people that I know, even in my own family, that have passed on now. Are they saved? I hope they are. But that's between them and the Lord. The evidence that I saw would indicate it's 
probably not the case, but I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Anyhow, so Sheol continues to this day for the bad along with Cain and the rest of all of history's bads. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is a reference, a passage of scripture we all know, so I'll just kind of glance through this very quickly. But in this passage, you know, um, we're being told that we shouldn't be ignorant uh, concerning those which are asleep or those that have died. All right, and, and we, we have a hope compared to those that have no hope is what this is talking about here. Okay, so if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're one of the goods. We're setting you aside. We're not talking about you. We're talking about those that haven't accepted Christ as their Savior. Those are the bads. Those are the ones that have no hope. And this passage is talking about those that have no hope. The difference is, though, that if we sleep or somebody we know sleeps in Jesus, we know that God is going to come and bring him home someday in the future. Verse 15 carries on with that same thing. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. So there is a good thing for those that are asleep that have faith in the Lord. But when this day comes, that is the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the living, if you don't have that relationship, guess what? You're one of the bads and you're staying in the grave. Oh, by the way, where are you? You're in hell. You're not coming out of there. There's no reprieve. Okay, all the people that are in there with you, they're staying with you too. Okay? You're not, you're not getting a free pass because the Lord has come back. Yay! Okay, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But the bad won't. The bad remain in the grave. Verse 17, Then we which are alive... Jumping down to the end of that little pass right there, uh, passage right there, so uh, ever be with the Lord. We which are alive in Christ, standing there at that moment, will be raised up. But there's a bunch of people standing around you that won't be. So on that day, it's going to be easy to know who the goods are and who the bads are. And unfortunately, the only people left on earth will be the bads, with one exception. And that's a group of people that have been marked. Let's take a look at that real quick in Revelation chapter 7. Okay, and this is a passage that you all know, so I'm really not going to go into a lot of detail on it. But we've got this angel who's got this seal of the living God. And he tells these other four angels, look, don't hurt the earth yet. All right? In other words, well, what is going to happen? The trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments are going to happen. And in that, people are going to die. Okay, people are going to die. But... Since the rapture has happened, everybody is going to be going away who are in the Lord's. That means only those who are the bads are left behind, except for God is going to seal the servants of God who are on, going to be left on the earth. And it happens to be 144,000 Jewish people. Okay, And so we know that that number, because it says there in verse 4, there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So at this moment in time, all the believers are out of the grave. Hades still exists. It's still filled with all of the bads. Okay, the rapture has occurred, which means that all believers are gone. Only unbelievers are left on the earth. In other words, the earth is covered with nothing but evil, with the exception of 144,000 who are sealed by the Lord. Imagine how evil that will be when there is nobody holding back anybody. And yet we also know that at that time, God does send some angels. And um, I'll talk about that in just a minute. So what we end up, though, is in heaven, we've got a great multitude that shows up there from all the nations, all the tribes, all the languages. Okay, and these are all the good people. They've got palms in their hands, and they're having a big celebration up there because they've made it. But at the same time, I can't help but think they've got to be wondering about those that are left behind. Just like the title of that book, Left Behind. Those are the bads. The bads are left behind. These people up there are talking about salvation to our God, which sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Praise the Lord. They have the relationship with the Lamb, but the people down there, they're going, where did everybody go? Well, wait a minute. My grandmother, she told me about this. My dad told me about this. My brother told me about this. My friend told me about this, and I poo-pooed it. I said, that's nice for you. It's not for me. How do I know that? Because I did that. 
I can think of four occasions when I had people come and try to witness to me, and I told them, you know, that's nice for you, but it's not for me. Praise the Lord, God didn't give up on me. Because I certainly had given up on him, right? And I will be one of these people standing there saying, ho, 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 am I so glad to be here, Lord? You know? I mean, my hands automatically go up. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that charismatic. I've got charisma, but I'm not that charismatic, you know? <laughs> but my hands go up when I think about that kind of stuff. And so here we've got John who's there, and John is being asked by one of the people who's up there, so who are all these people, John? Because he's seen this great multitude. I've never seen this many people before, he's thinking. Who are all these people? And John says, I, I don't know who these people are. And so then that angelic being, that elder, says, these are they which came out of great tribulation. And so we know what that's going to look like. We read it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, those who were dead were going to be raised. Those who were alive at the moment, they were going to be caught up. And that's what happened. It happens in the time of the great tribulation. And so we've got this now great multitude. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Everybody else that is on the earth is not except for the 144,000. And so we have God now, being the great God that he is, is not going to give up on the bads. At some point in time, he will, okay, but not yet. So here in Revelation chapter 14, we see there in verse 6, there's an angel that flies by in the midst of heaven. And he preaches to all of the people on the earth. All of the bads get one last opportunity to hear the gospel. All right, look, you see what's happened. How can you not see what happened? I'm guessing that there's probably still the TV stations going and the radio stations and all the reports that are going on. There's been some kind of a virus that's taken everybody. You know, I mean, it's a flesh-eating virus. It's instantaneous, and that's why they're gone. They're going to come up with some kind of a lie like they do now. Okay. But these angelic beings are going to be heard by every single person on the earth, and this one particular one here is going to preach the everlasting gospel to them. So everybody's going to be able to hear. The bads will be able to hear and will be able to change their mind to become the goods. And some of them will. Another angel right immediately at that same time is going to say, Fear God, give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Many of you have already heard about this. Okay. Worship him. All the bads will hear it, and some will choose to become goods. In verse 8, it goes on and it says, There's another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, this system, the Babylon system, drew people away from God, and now God is coming back to them with these three angelic beings and say, come out, come out, wherever you are. This is the worst game of hide-and-seek that there has ever been. I know where you are. Come out. And so they have the choice one last time to become goods. Meanwhile, though, God's getting ready to bring his trumpet judgments down and bring his bowl judgments down. And part of this whole process is receiving the mark of the beast on the right hand or on the forehead. If you take the mark of the beast, one of these angels says, you're doomed. Don't take it. If you take the mark of the beast, you are marked as bad for eternity. Don't take the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. God doesn't bring his wrath upon his goods. He only brings his wrath upon those who are not his goods and are the bads. So you have a way to save yourself here. You've heard the gospel, accept that gospel message, which is poured out. In other words, God is going to pour out his wrath upon the bads, especially those that take the mark of the beast. Okay? And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Fire. Hey, wait, that's Hades, isn't it? Okay, fire and brimstone. All right, and verse 11 continues, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest. Those who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. 
Keeping in mind, we've already seen the resurrection, we've already seen the rapture, now we've got this, these three angelic beings that are going across the face of the earth. Don't take the mark of the beast, that's the main ultimate culmination, but you also have to make a choice to go from being bad to being good. Right? And then it says here that this is the patience of the saints. Now wait a minute, there's nothing but bad people on the earth. But this is indicating that some do come to faith. Some do change the color of their spots. Right? Some go from being bads to being goods. And these are the saints, and they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus after they've heard that gospel message. And then it goes on, and it gets worse from here. We know that God ends up raining down His wrath upon humanity. But it talks about here, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, which then implies not blessed are those who die not in the Lord. Right? And so this is where it's not always easy to find a verse that says specifically this, that, and the other, but by implication, we look to those that are good, but to those that are left over, those are the bads. And so if you are not in the Lord and you die, which, believe me, when the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments come, there will be a lot of dying going on. And the only dying that will be going on at the hand of God will be against the bads. And when they die, they will be going into that place of hell, that place of Hades. They will be held there until a time in the future. All right. And so we see in chapter 14 then that there's a gathering of the vine of the earth. So humanity now is being dealt with by God. The great wine press of the wrath of God now is coming down upon mankind. All of those who are the bads, and yet there are some who are becoming saints as they recognize their need to accept that message that they heard from those three angelic beings. The winepress of God, though, is coming down, that wrath of God, and it's being trodden down, trodden hard, blood splashing in the sense, spiritual sense and physical sense, and comes out of the wine press. And those are all bads that are being, being dealt with by God. Keep in mind, though, Satan is still about his business. Satan is still trying to get anybody who will not take the mark of the beast. Okay, if he catches them and he says, take the mark, and they say, no, that's because they're one of the saints, they'll be beheaded, but that's not at the hands of God, that's at the hands of Satan, and we know that they will come back to life again later on in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation chapter 16, as we kind of fly through some more of this here, the fourth angel pours out his vial, that's a bowl judgment on the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. This is while they're still alive. While they're still alive. This is not Hades, this is people on the face of the earth. And men were scorched with great heat, and you'd think they'd say, please forgive me, I'm so sorry, and yet they don't do that. They blaspheme God. These are the bads, blaspheming the name of God, and they repented not to give him glory. In verse 10, it goes on, and it says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Please, God, I'm sorry. No, that's not what they do. They blaspheme the God of heaven. These are the bads. They are so bad. They're getting close to being the worst, aren't they? If there were a way to be the baddest. They blaspheme the God of heaven. They're becoming like Satan, aren't they? Okay. And they repent not of their deeds. Verse 16, he gathers them together into the place called the in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is talking about the armies now that come against Israel. They're all gathered in Armageddon. And there fell upon men at that time and also worldwide great hail out of heaven. Okay, When we get done with the bold judgments, every single bad person is dead. Every single bad person is in Hades. Every single bad person is in that place that was established for the devil and has run through time, and now it is completely full. At this moment in time, there are no others to add because they've all been wiped out. Anybody who's left alive are those that became saints during that last period of time, and they're the ones that are going to walk into the millennial reign. Okay, so the people walking into the millennial reign are all believers. Okay, Revelation chapter 17 then. Picking it up in verse 8, And the beast that thou sawest, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. Um, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. These are bads. 
Okay, if your name isn't in the book of life, you are one of the bad people. So we see that these people are there and they're existing and they're dealing with the beast and they're on his side and not on the Lord's side. And they're beholding the beast and they're saying, what an amazing person this is, this beast. Um, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. And he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth. In other words, the whore is this religious structure, the system that is causing people to be adulterous to God. They are not for God. They're not for the one they should be for. And they are being drawn away. And this whore is doing that to all the people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. There's nobody who can get away from being a bad person under this influence unless they come to faith in Jesus. So the bad people are everywhere. Some come to faith. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Then it says, And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet. So now we're talking about the Antichrist and the false prophet that wrought miracles before the Antichrist, with which he deceived them. So there are people who are deceived on the earth. Those are the bad people who were deceived on the earth and received the mark of the beast. They were told not to. Everybody heard that message. Don't take the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his image, they were told not to worship God, it said. And they chose not to worship God. They chose not to give him glory. They chose to blaspheme him instead. Okay, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning brimstone. So that's the Antichrist and the false prophet that were thrown into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Revelation 20 continues in verse 10. And it says here, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So now, th this isn't ugly, by the way. Okay, this guy's an ugly, so d we'll disregard him for a moment. But there are people who were deceived by him. Those are bads. They were deceived by him. So we see that the devil, the Antichrist, we see that uh, the false prophet are all thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's a long time last I checked. Verse 14, it says here, and death and hell. Here's Hades. Okay, this is the place that was prepared from the beginning of time. And it's been filling up, filling up, filling up, filling up. We know at a certain point in time, the goods were pulled out when Christ rose from the dead. So that place now, when a person dies now, they go straight into heaven. They don't go to this holding place anymore. But if they die today and they don't have Christ, they go into that Hades place. And it continues to fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up. And then finally, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, along with the Antichrist, along with Satan, along with the false prophet, Okay, along with the demonic angelic beings, and it says here that this is the second death. See, this is the second death. You can die once physically, but if you die spiritually, you're lost. You can die once physically, but if you're born again, you'll have eternal life. These people don't have, the bads do not have eternal life, they have eternal death. In fire, in brimstone, no relief, no water for the tongue like the rich man was asking for. And who are these people? Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So... The bads don't have a good thing coming. Unless they join the team of the goods, they don't have a good thing coming. So we know the goods have it good, don't they? We know the bads have the potential to have it good, but the bads have a choice to make. Just like the goods already made, the bads have a choice to make. Which team will they be on? And that team is only joined through Jesus Christ. Okay? So we've talked about the good. We've talked about the bad. Next session, we'll be talking about the ugly. And I've already let the cat out of the bag on a few of them and who they are. But we'll talk about them and, and um, their impact on humanity as well. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this uh, information that you give us. It's very clear in Scripture. You give us a choice. You're not a God of ro robots. You're a God who gives choices. And so, Father, we thank you that well, for those of us that have accepted Christ as our Savior, we thank you that you've already 
redeemed us. And it's just a work in progress right now. We thank you, Father, that we can trust you that this body that we're wearing, it's going to go away. And that we'll have another body that'll be redeemed, that'll be better, that'll be eternal. And we look forward to that day when we can enjoy ourselves in your presence, not just for a little while, not just for a brief visit, but instead for eternity. And so, Lord, we just pray now as people leave here today that you'd um, give them safe travel, bless their day, bless all their loved ones. And we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.